Hello everyone, this is going to be the first installment of a new video series called Audient Interfaces Explained Accessibly. Now say this three times in quick succession. This series will concentrate on discovering the Audient Interface series in an accessible manner, explaining all the knobs, the functionalities, the connectors, the layout, and discovering the features that the software has to offer and how we BlindFork can actually use those features accessibly. This is also the first video on my channel, which contains visuals, allowing the sighted audience to follow along. Let's jump right into it. Audio interfaces are hardware designed to connect external devices like microphones, headphones, speakers, all those kind of audio devices to digital systems like a PC, like an iPad, a tablet. So that's what audio interfaces are. And the company Audient, which is located in the UK, are producing audio interfaces and other audio hardware devices since about 20 years, more than 20 years by now. We are especially looking at their audio interfaces. They are producing other hardware like extenders for those interfaces. We will talk about that later. But uh, especially interesting for us are the audio interfaces. Before getting to the one interface that I'm going to focus on today, I will list you all the interfaces that Audient has available right now and what the differences between those interfaces actually are. Audient first created a set of interfaces, which is the ID4, the ID14, the ID22, and the ID44 interface, which were created also known as the Mark I interfaces which were the first interfaces Audient ever created. And after doing that, they came to the conclusion that they had to upgrade the interfaces. And that's why they released the Mark II interfaces as well, which are not fully released through the entire set of interfaces yet. So we have the ID4 Mark II and the ID14 Mark II. The ID22 and the ID44 didn't receive any upgrade to Mark II yet. Also, they released the Evo 4 and Evo 8 interfaces within their Mark II series. Let's discuss them for a really quick overview. First of all, the similarities between all the interfaces. Every single interface comes with an instrument plug. That means that it can plug it like a guitar or every other instrument that you can think of into the interface for recording purposes. Every single interface comes with at least two separate inputs which are XLR and TRS jack combination inputs, which means that you can use them as either XLR microphone input or TRS line-in inputs. All of the microphone inputs are phantom power enabled and every input can be toggled separately from all the other microphone inputs. Let's get into the specifics of the ID4 Mark II. The ID4 Mark II got two inputs and two outputs, means that you can connect one pair of speakers to it. It got a headphone jack, it got the already mentioned instrument connector, and since it's a Mark II device, it is USB-C with USB 3.0 connection and USB-C bus powered. Means that it does not require any external power plug. You just plug it into your system via USB-C. It usually comes with a USB-C to USB-A cable as well if you don't have a USB-C connection yet. And it will be fully charged and fully powered through that connection only, including the phantom power. The ID14 Mark II got two inputs on the device itself. It got six outputs overall, means four speaker outputs, each two stereo pairs, and two separate headphone outputs on the front, a small and a large jack connector, which are similar in that you cannot have separate volumes for the different outputs, but you can connect two pairs of headphones. If you have someone who wants to listen to the same mix than you do, you can just plug in a second pair of headphones and you're good to go. You have the same instrument input, and you have an optical connection, which is the similarity between all the larger interfaces that Audient is producing. The optical connection can be used 
either for sending in two separate channels via optical source. You can, for example, plug in your TV into this interface. You can plug in an old PlayStation 3 device, for example, which got an optical connection. Everything that has an optical output can be plugged into the interface. And as long as you configure the interface as an SPDIF receiver, you can send in any two-channel source into the interface, which is kind of neat, right? But the second functionality of this optical input is that it can be configured to be an ADAT source. And ADAT is an extension protocol for audio devices, which allows the transfer of multiple audio streams at the same time. Audion, for example, uses this and allows the interfaces to connect to a different source, like a different input rack that they are offering as well, which allows recording of eight additional input sources like microphones, instruments, and all this kind of stuff. That's where the 10 inputs are coming from. The interface itself is really small and compact and has only two inputs at the back, like XLR and TRS connectors, but it can be extended via ADAT to up to 10 inputs. It's also fully USB-C bus powered, just like the ID4 Mark II. The other interfaces like the ID22 and the ID44 are Mark I devices, so they are not USB-C bus powered. I'm pretty sure that they are using a typical external power plug to power themselves. The ID22 got 10 inputs and 14 outputs. I'm pretty sure that they are provided with two ADAT connections, means that eight of the inputs are via ADAT and eight of the outputs are via ADAT, means that you have two optical connections on this device. The other two inputs are directly at the device and the other six outputs are directly on the device itself as well. The ID44 got two optical connections as well, eight in and eight out. It got 20 overall inputs and 24 overall outputs. Everything else is directly at the device. Everything else seems to be quite similar to the 22 and to the other interfaces as well. The only difference seems to be the amount of inputs and outputs here. The last two remaining interfaces, which are Mark II devices, are the EVO 4 and the EVO 8, which are branded as the devices for home studios getting started with podcasting, streaming, producing, all those kinds of tasks. They do not come with optical connections, but the EVO 4 got two inputs and two outputs right on the device. It got an instrument connector as usual. It got a feature called Smart Gain, which is a feature that only the EVO series has, and it basically allows you to automatically adjust your gain of your microphones without you having to turn a knob and do anything, mess it up, anything like that. The smart gain will just do everything for you. We measure the volume that your microphone is coming in and, and adjust the incoming gain appropriately. And the Evo 8 comes with four inputs, four outputs, and is otherwise identical to the Evo 4. All of those interfaces have in common that you have those really, really quiet microphone preamps. So the Mark II interfaces come with a dynamic range of 128 or something like that decibels, which is really, really nice. And all of the devices can record in up to 96 kilohertz. Let's make our way to the ID40 Mark II now, which right now is sitting in front of me. I had the opportunity to test this device for about three months now, and I'm really happy with it. The mic preamps are really great, and everything software related can be handled in some way or another by blind users. The only thing we cannot do right now is monitoring peaks directly within the audience software, but there are ways around that by using Reaper as our DAW, for example which is able to capture the sound directly from the interface and checking the peak. Okay, let's get right into it. So if we have the interface set up right in front of us, then we will start with the front panel, which is really clean and it just got three connectors. The leftmost one is the TS connector, the JFET connector for the instrument, like a guitar, for example. The other two connectors, which are at the very right of the panel, are the headphone connectors, 
which basically do the same, but in two different sizes. And you can plug your headphones into whichever one you want and you're good to go. The next and more complicated panel is the top panel. The top panel contains two pairs of controls of which every pair contains a knob, which you can turn and a switch, which you can flip either on or off. Those two pairs of controls are the left of the top panel. And on the right side of the top panel, you will find a large encoder dial, which you can press, but also turn. And you will find three buttons below this knob. Let's start from the very left, where you will find a pair of controls, which is one knob and one switch. The switch is aligned directly below the knob. The knob controls the gain of your first input either mic or line in, depending what you plugged in on the back. The knob has a limit, which means that you have a lowest and highest position that you can reach. I'm not entirely sure what the lowest and highest positions actually are, but this is basically the preamp, the gain knob for your microphone or line in one. The switch, which is directly below this knob, controls your phantom power and it can be toggled either on or off. Directly to the right of those two controls are the exact same controls and they work in exact the same way for your second input of the interface. The most important controls however are the controls on the right of the top panel. Let's turn to those. There we have the large encoder dial and the three buttons directly below. The encoder can do multiple things depending on the current configuration of the interface and that's what the buttons are for. Let's therefore check the buttons from left to right. The leftmost button says main mix. If you press that button, then turning the encoder knob will turn the volume of your main mix up or down respectively. Pressing the encoder knob in this mode will allow you to mute your main mix. Pressing it again will unmute respectively. Let's skip the button in the middle for a second and let's explain the most right one button. The right button is the headphone button. It basically does the same as the main mix button, but for the headphones. Pressing that will allow you to control the volume of your headphone output. And pressing the encoder after pressing the headphone button will allow you to mute your headphone output entirely. Please remember that the configuration that you're in gets remembered as long as the interface got USB bus power. So if you press the headphones button and you forgot to actually change it back to, for example, the main mix setting or something like that, turning the encoder will still change the headphone volume and not the main mix volume, unless you hit the leftmost button again, and then you can turn the encoder and change the main mix volume again. The middle button does something totally different. It's the so-called ID button. Pressing that will let the encoder knob run free, <laughs> basically. Because what you can do with that, you can actually access the encoder within your DAW and map some functionality to it. So by pressing the ID button, we tell the interface to say, okay, now the encoder won't do anything for the interface itself, but you, DAW, will have the opportunity to take any parameter you want of any plugin you like, assign it to the encoder, and you can recognize the encoder position everything within your DAW. I've not used this before. Uh, I've done any experience with it yet, but that's in theory how it's supposed to work. If you're interested in that functionality, just let me know in the comment section below and I will see if I can find out something and dig up something, maybe even create a test project where I can demonstrate this behavior. That's already it for the top panel. Let's finish off with the back panel. The back panel only contains connectors. We don't have any buttons, knobs, controls, nothing over here. The leftmost connectors on the back panel are the two inputs, which are basically TRS connectors as well as XLR connectors in one connector. So the usual double connectors that we know from almost any modern mixer or interface. The next two connectors are two outputs, the first two outputs, the main speaker outputs, basically. And the same goes for the last pair of outputs. Directly next to the main speaker outputs are the alternative speaker outputs. 
The next connector is the optical connector, the optical input, which can be either configured as SPDIF or aided. I explained this earlier. If you need some more information on that, just let me know and I will probably create a video on this. And the final connector on the back is the USB-C connector. You will find a USB to USB-C cable within the box of the interface, as well as a USB-C to USB-A connector, which is USB-A, the usual USB connection that you already know and love. You can either decide to go with USB-C to USB-C if you have like a Mac with modern USB-C connection, but if you have an older PC and you're still using only the usual USB connection, then you can decide to go with the USB-A connection as well. As long as you're using a USB 3.0 connector on your PC, everything will be fine. And that's already it for explaining the hardware overview of the interface. The only thing that's left is on the right side of the device is a Kensington lock connection. If you are willing to use this interface at universities or somewhere where you actually need to protect it from thievery, then this would probably be interesting to you, but otherwise you won't even notice or use this. And that's already it for giving you an overview over the audience interface and especially the ID40 Mark II, at least hardware wise. In the next videos, we will focus on how we Blind4 can actually achieve different tasks like creating our mixes, creating sub mixes, routing those mixes to different outputs, setting up loopback and talkback, and all those kind of different tasks. If you have any questions or any matters that need to be solved and you want me to help you, just let me know in the comment section below and I will probably respond either with a comment or with another video on the topic. For now, that should have been it. Feel free to leave a like, subscribe, whatever you want to do. For all the sighted people, just let me know what you think of the visuals that I put into the video. And until next time, see ya.